Uh, we're going to start in about two minutes. Okay? Thank you. There are 22 tribal nations in Arizona. ASU's campuses are situated on the homelands of many indigenous peoples, including the Akamel Atham and Peeposh. Arizona State University recognizes the original inhabitants of these lands and recognizes that they still reside throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we recognize the impact of their wisdom and generosity towards us. If you've flown into the valley, you have undoubtedly seen the Salt River Project canals that surround the area. Those modern day canals follow the framework of the canals originally constructed by ancestral Sonoran Desert people, Huhukam, to make this area both livable and a place where peoples could thrive. We acknowledge that the modern day indigenous nations that descended from the ancestral peoples are the original inhabitants of this land.
Ogre. I'm the uh, Reynolds Professor of Business Journalism here at the Cronkite School, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our speakers for a discussion about truth and trust in the media, and what other topic could be more important to journalists and to our democracy than this one. Uh, it's so important that we're making an afternoon out of this. So following this discussion, we'll have another one led by Cronkite faculty members, uh, Leonard Downer, Downey Jr. and Andrew Hayward, uh, the authors of a new study, Beyond Objectivity, Producing Trustworthy News in Today's Newsrooms. I urge you not to miss that one. Uh, it'll be held here from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, and in between the two sessions, um, there'll be food and you can relax and enjoy yourself. So please do make an afternoon of it. Um, I want to thank the, uh, uh, the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict at ASU, which has made this discussion possible today. So for the past three years, this school, the Cronkite School, and the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict have been holding seminars and discussions with scholars and practitioners of journalism on weighty topics like uh, truth and objectivity and saving our democracy. Um, and they have brought in uh, uh, Mr. Lowry for about, what, three days now? Three day um, uh, routine of uh, talking about this topic, including tomorrow. So, um, but to get on with today, I'm excited to welcome Mr. Lowry for a conversation with Cronkite Dean Bentinto Batts. Uh, Mr. Lowry is one of the most accomplished, interesting, and thoughtful journalists of our time. I was amused uh, to read in, on his LinkedIn page uh, that he dabbles in various forms of journalism. Uh, dabbles is one way to put it. Uh, <laughs> he is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, a best-selling author, a podcast host, an on-air television correspondent, a documentary filmmaker, and a teacher of journalism. Much of his work is focused on issues of race and law enforcement. As a journalist, he has extensively chronicled police violence and the Black Lives Matter movement in this country. The work for which he received the Pulitzer Prize was a real-time database tracking fatal police shootings in the US. His best-selling book, They Can't Kill Us All, Ferguson, Baltimore, and a New Era in America's Racial Justice Movement chronicles police violence in America. His documentary, In the Cold Dark Night, tells the story of efforts to solve the 1983 lynching of Timothy Coggins, a, a black man. And his podcast, Ernie's Secret, uh, examines the life and career of Ernest C. Withers, a famed civil rights photographer who also happened to be a paid uh, FBI informant. Uh, in addition to producing his podcast, uh, Mr. Lowry is a journalist in residence at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at City University of New York and a contributing editor at the Marshall Project. Uh, Mr. Lowry will be talking with Dean Batts, who um, also has done some dabbling throughout his career as a newspaper journalist, lecturer, philanthropist, strategic communications professional, higher education administrator, and a nonprofit executive. And he too has some experience covering law enforcement. He began his career as a police reporter in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Dean Batts came to the Cronkite School in 2021 after serving as director of journalism strategies at the Scripps Howard Foundation in Cincinnati. So Dean Batts and Mr. Lowry will talk for about 40 minutes, after which we will open it up for questions, which is why there's a microphone here at the front of the room. So be thinking about what kind of questions you want to ask, line up at the microphone afterward, and join the conversation. So let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Dean Batts and Mr. Lowry. Thank you, uh, Wesley, and, and uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, well, it's great to have you, and I've known you for some time. Uh, our paths have crossed uh, before, and you were actually a judge with the Scripps Howard Awards a few years, and you went to the UW Scripps School of Journalism at uh, Ohio University. So uh, again, we've got a lot uh, in common, but really happy to have you for this discussion today, and I'm, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, you have uh, been working to advance this discussion about objectivity, and I'm going to go to a, a tweet that you had from last week. Uh -huh. uh, and it's your tweet said, "Okay, cr the critique of objectivity in journalism 
has always been about the reality in practice, not the principle. Defending the principle of rigorous, fact-based reporting and framing that as a response to the critique of objectivity is to construct an elaborate straw man to knock down. Hmm. What were you getting at? I think that too often in this conversation, we have a lot of people who are saying the same things yet talking past each other. Um, it's actually very interesting because in his writing, Walter Lippmann writes about journalists and their editors seeing the world as they wish it would be and not as it actually is. And I actually think that that surfaces a lot in this debate and in this conversation. We want a journalism and a media that is fact-based, that is rigorous, that is nuanced, that contains context, that is fair, but that's clear. Right when the weight of the evidence says something that we don't pull our punches. And in so much as there's been a debate over objectivity, people on both sides of this quote unquote debate want those things. I think the difficulty has been there is a set of people who, who are practitioners of our craft, who care about our craft, but who insist upon describing our craft in the way that we wish it would be. And I think that the critique of the status quo comes from practitioners who care about our craft, who insist upon describing it the way it actually is. That too often, we've set a standard and a goal, and we have not met it. And in response to criticism, we go, well, that's not true, because we're objective. And the criticism is, but you, but you weren't, but the work you just did didn't meet the standard. And we go, no, but we're objective. And they say, well, but in this instance, you kind of both sides this, or in this instance, you pulled a punch, or in this instance, you seem to not be clear, and the goal seemed to be to be inoffensive, not to be to tell objective truths. And the response is, let's not, let's not discuss those criticisms, because objectivity is not both sides. And it is not, well, we understand what the term is not supposed to mean. The criticism is that in practice, too often it means that, right? And I think that what's difficult is that, you know, like I said, I, I sometimes even hesitate when described as, you know, a quote unquote opponent of objectivity, or a, because I'm not. I, I believe in objective facts, I believe in the rigorous fact finding role of journalists and reporters, right? The critique is of how so often in the decades since Walter Lippmann, we have set a standard through our marketing and through our branding that we have then not met, and how that has eroded the, the quality and utility of this term. And, and so that, that's what I think about. That's, and so I get frustrated sometimes when, in response to that, we then have a conversation that is people very earnestly defending the standard or the value that is not under attack. It's the practice that I think a lot of people over the years have found wanting. Well, then, uh, let's, let's go back for a moment and let's just talk about you and your career. Uh, you're, you've done a lot in a short time. And you actually were born the year I graduated from college. So <laughs> that, that makes me feel either old or not working hard enough. But you've done quite a, quite a bit. You've won a Pulitzer Prize already. Uh, you've uh, worked at the Washington Post, you've done work for 60 Minutes. Let's talk about your what inspired you to get into journalism, and then let's move to where you see your role and what, what, what you're doing for the industry and how that then moves to this discussion about objectivity. Sure, well, so I have two answers to the first question. The, 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 uh, the first answer is that you know, I remember I got involved in my middle school newspaper, and then my high school newspaper, and then my college newspaper, and that I was very quickly addicted to the act of journalism. That the idea, the concept that I could wake up in the morning with a question, call people smarter than me, ask them all my questions, and at the end of the day write up what they told me seemed like cheating, right? That that could be a job that I did every day, was just have questions and get them answered, and they would pay me to do that seemed unreal. That seemed way better than a real job. And as we know, obviously, journalism involves and entails 
a little bit more than that, but at the core, that is really what it is. Waking up with a curiosity, finding people who can help answer that question, placing their answers in concert with each other, and coming out with, with some type of uh, attempt at, at explaining what is real and what is true. Uh, secondarily, right, uh, my father was in journalism uh, for years. He was at the Bergen Record and the Cleveland Plain Dealer, um, and you know, still does some writing and, and comms work. And I like to think that it had nothing to do with, with that. Um, in fact, he was a little passive aggressive. He didn't want me to get into journalism. He was like, I did that so that you could go be a doctor or a lawyer. What are you doing? Um, but I, you know, I've done enough therapy now that I have to acknowledge that it is probably true <laughs> that that had something to do uh, with the, the way that I s saw journalism as a noble profession that we were a home where there were journalists in our home where we talked about those types of things. We didn't have yard signs like other people because of the work that my dad did. Uh, we watched the news after Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune and the first person up had to go get the newspaper. And you know, I lived, I'm of a generation where I have friends for whom that was also true, but I had a lot of friends for whom that wasn't because things were starting to change. And so I definitely benefited from growing up in a house where the idea of journalism and being a journalist and was seen as, as a civic good and something that was important. I, I was also, you know, my dad was not just a journalist, but a black journalist. And, and so because of that, I grew up in a tradition where we accepted as a given that the institution of journalism is imperfect, that it requires a constant improvement, that it wasn't necessarily set up. Um, at its inception to serve people like us, um, and that even as it's trying to more so, that it still might need some nudging in certain directions. I grew up understanding that when I was in a newsroom, there might be stories that were important to me or people in my family or my community that would not be told if I not, did not do that. And, and also that it was my job to always try to reach behind me and advocate and agitate for more people like me to receive some of these opportunities. And so I think all of that informs these conversations, right? I, I think that our conversation about our standards and about the function of our industry is as much about who gets to be setting them and, and, and who is involved and at the table in these conversations. And, and what we see now is a rising generation of journalists, it, frankly, behind me even, not, it's, I'm, I'm I'm not the rising generation anymore, right? Uh, it's, it's folks coming up behind me even who, who insist upon a level of parity in the newsroom and in our industry, who are willing to call out things that they don't um, like, who are very, very resistant to doing things that they think might in some ways be furthering harm just because it's the way we work institutionally. And also, frankly, who are coming of age and coming into our field at a time when our economics have been completely disrupted. It's a lot easier sometimes to kind of sit down and shut up when you know that you're working inside of a velvet coffin, you can work here for 25 or 30 years, you'll get paid, you'll get a raise every year, you'll get to work up. Unfortunately, that's not the field that we occupy today. Things are very disruptive. Uh, things are very difficult, even at some of our uh, most esteemed and successful organizations, much less everywhere else. And so because of that insecurity, I think that's actually created an environment in which people are more willing to say, well, let me speak up about what I, what I think we should be doing or not, because it's not as if I'm going to be here for 500 years anyway. And I, I think that is markedly different than the 80s or 90s. Okay. All uh, accomplished people or, you know, have sort of a framework or people they seek to model themselves after. Who are your heroes or your models uh, that you have really chosen to sort of follow in your approach to this? It's really interesting. You know, sometimes when I talk to students, what I say to them is that in every newsroom they work on, in or every team they work on, there are people around them who they can <laughs> steal methods from, right? That so much of, I, I think, and it's the way I learn, right, is by seeing people who are doing the things you want to do and mimicking them and, and, and going after how they, they do it. And so for me, it's kind of an expansive list, right? I think about, 
you know, when I was, so for example, when I was doing more on camera work with CBS, I was, I was watching a lot of old Ed Bradley and, and trying to think about what does it look like and how do you interact on camera. When I was doing more feature writing at The Post, I was, I was sitting across from Ann Hall, one of the greatest feature writers to ever write, and, and thinking about how do, I, uh, how do I see and learn from the work they're doing to try to, to build upon that, right? I, I look at some of my friends, whether it be ta or Nicole or others, and, I, and, I, and Jelani Cobb, and I, and I think about the way they use rhetoric to form argument um, and the way they infuse history in, into argument, which I think is really important, especially important in this moment as we talk about contextualized journalism. Um, but then I also, I, I, I think a lot about the journalist who came before us um, as black journalists who really had to fight both to get into the room, to do the work they wanted to do, and who still managed to do work of such excellence, right? And that's a, a very long list of, of people, but that's kind of who I return back to. You know, I, I had a, a quote at my desk for a long time from uh, from Gerald Boyd, who was the first black managing editor of the New York Times, um, he, until Bean Bacay became the executive editor. He was the highest ranking black man in the history of the Times. And when he received that promotion to the number two spot, he gave a quote, I think, to the Times. And he said that, I hope that tomorrow some black kid picks up the New York Times, reads about their new managing editor, and dreams a bigger dream about what he might be able to do. And I think that that's really important. And so I've benefited a lot from being able to see people doing the types of things that I hope or aspire to one day be able to do. And so my hope also then is, even being relatively young, is how can I be an encouragement to people who are coming up behind me? And so that's the example I hope to live up to and, and what I also hope to, uh, to be able to do each day. Lastly, on that line, uh, what about Ida B. Wells? Uh, so what I actually think is interesting, and it's remarkable, you know, I'm not that far out of school. I am, I am far out of school. But um, even when I was in school, Ida B. Wells wasn't someone who we were broadly across the industry talking about the way we are today. And what I think is remarkable is someone who's done a lot of, who's done a lot of data journalism and counting, it's remarkable to think about the work that she did. Now, I, I haven't done enough of the historical research to be able to claim that she was a first, right? But I definitely think of her as a pioneer in data journalism. And the reason I say that, you know, I've got a friend who's at the uh, National Archives, and he sent to me a copy of Ida B. Wells' Red Record. It was a map of the United States where she had gone state by state and tallied up how many lynchings had occurred in a period of time. And she had sent it to Congress as the official data in support of federal anti-lynching legislation. Now, the legislation wasn't passed. But I have this map framed above my desk at home. It's impossible to look at that work and not see what we would later call data journalism or computer-assisted reporting, or right, right? That this was someone who, decades ago, at great personal cost, had her printing press blown up by white supremacists, got run out of town, was being attacked by name in the New York Times, was being told she was making it all up, who went and case by case investigated lynchings, kept as accurate of a record as she could, and we now have a benefit of seeing that and knowing, and knowing what was true, right? And I think that that gets to so much of what all these conversations were about. It is not that there were not other reporters who cared about these issues and tried to look at them. But it's unsurprising that it was a black woman who decided that this was so important that she was gonna do it even at a time when it was politically unpopular to tell the truth about lynchings. That it was politically unpopular to note that most of these men were innocent of the things they were being accused of. That this was happening frequently. This wasn't some just every once in a while. And she did that work at great, like I said, great personal sacrifice, not because she was believed in her time, but because she knew fundamentally what I think is the cornerstone of our journalism, 
which is that our job is to write down true things. And those true things may not be appreciated today. And they may not be appreciated ever, but there's a chance that they'll be appreciated by history. And so now, well, generations after her, we're honoring her with the Pulitzer Prize, and her name is on professorships and awards. And she didn't live to see any of that. Uh, but that wasn't the point, and I think she knew that. And so I certainly do think about that. You know, when we did the Fatal Force Project, the Washington Post, coming out of Ferguson, we came under pretty withering attack. Um, and I did as the face of that project. In 2014 or 2015, it was considered anti-police to even ask how many people the police were killing. We, were, we came under very vicious attack and sustained attack from uh, right-wing conservative publications and, and influencers. They would write these pieces, well, look at this person who's in the Washington Post's database. They were a terrorist. They're trying to, and it's like, well, were they killed by the police? Because that's what the database is of, right? It was this effort to frame what was a objective act as somehow a political act. Right? And it was political in so much as we were creating information that didn't otherwise exist. We were seeking an answer to a question. But, and to the post credit, we didn't waver, and our leadership didn't waver as we came under those attacks. Ultimately, by the end of it, those same critics were citing our information to make their political points. It was anti-police to count how many people the police shoot, but now that this information exists, let us tell you why the information proves that we don't do anything wrong. And so, fine, good, again, the aim was to create the information and put it into the dialogue. And, and even though it was unpopular, with not that much benefit of hindsight, it is now very clear that what we were doing was not only appropriate, but it was necessary. And so I try really hard, and it's hard to always remember it, but in these moments to remember that people are gonna be mad and the politics of the moment are gonna get all spun up, but if you're right, if you're rigorous, if we're holding to our standards and our values, it's all gonna come out in the wash and by the end, everyone's gonna have to come here and listen to me talk about it even if they were mad about it before. So that, um, that position that you laid out there was sort of present in a piece that you wrote in 2020 for the New York Times mm -hmm. uh, and getting into the discussion about objectivity and coverage of some uh, key issues that you talked about, uh, policing and uh, the deaths of, of African Americans. And in it you wrote, since American journalism's pivot many decades ago from an openly partisan press to a model of professed objectivity, the mainstream has allowed what it considers objective truth to be decided almost exclusively by white reporters and their mostly white bosses. And those selective truths have been calibrated to avoid offending the sensibility of white readers. You went on to say that the views and inclinations of whiteness are accepted as the objective neutral. When black and brown, brown reporters and editors challenge these conventions, it's not uncommon for them to be pushed out, reprimanded, or robbed of new opportunities. That's mm -hmm. pretty heavy. Yeah, and it's unfortunately the reality of our of the last century of our journalistic history. Now to be clear, that's not to say that there have been no strides, that our newsrooms today don't look very different than they looked at the beginning of newsroom integration in the late 50s, 60s, 70s, depending on when your newspaper kind of got it together. Um, but what we know is that the staff of a mainstream newsroom, and that's not just our papers, that's our local broadcast channels, that's our magazines, that's our cable news channels, very rarely reflect the diversity and complication of the American mosaic. And it's important for us to construct newsrooms that have that reflection, because what we know is that we all do bring our own lived experiences, our biases, our understandings, our sourcing. When something happens, the ability of a newsroom to, to paint an objective picture of what has gone on Re relies on and requires us to be able to reach a bunch of different people who will talk to us and talk to us with candor. We are empowered to do that when we have representatives of every community in the room. And we are disempowered to do that when we don't. That's not to say that journalists can't, can't effectively, accurately, thoughtfully cover communities that aren't their own. I get sent into communities that aren't my own all the time. And I read great coverage by reporters who are covering communities they're not from. 
but it's to say as a whole. I, I really do believe that this level of diversity is journalistically imperative, that we cannot do the thing we set out to do if we do not start at that point, no matter how well-intentioned we are, no matter how hard we work at it, because we need people in the room. There's a creative chaos that comes from getting a bunch of different people together and slamming all their heads together. And we argue and we debate and we think. When we did Fatal Force, we sat there in that room and we argued. How do you define armed versus unarmed in one of these circumstances? If someone has a toy gun, are they armed or are they unarmed? If someone is driving a car and the police say they're driving it at them, how do we mark them? And we, I mean, really argued, like people leaving the room, getting up, I mean, we, but it was the same argument happening around the country. In that case, the team we put together was able to be a microcosm of the national conversation. And because of that, our journalism benefited. And so I think it is so important for us as we talk about what our values are, as we talk about what our methods are, as we talk about what our core principles are, I really do think that we have to center this idea of constructing and building a journalism that is reflective of that mosaic, right? And it's not just a few of us trying to tell the stories of everyone. I'm going to pivot. You've got a new book coming out in June. Mm -hmm. It's entitled American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of Progress. And so I had the opportunity to read some excerpts from it. I'm just going to read a, uh, a few things from it. Well, I haven't read it in a while, so it's going to be new to me. <laughs> but you, you juxtapose this against the election of uh, Barack Obama. And you, you start off by saying it seems somewhat silly now, more than a decade later, to dwell on the images and feelings and sounds of that November night. So you're referring to the night of the election. Uh, to recall the gravity of the moment and the jubilation. Because to revisit the eve of Barack Obama's election is to venture into a world that feels foreign now. November 2008 was a collective moment of true, unabashed hope. You go on to say that the years that followed Obama's election would see two long simmering racial movements burst into the fore of mainstream politics. The first of these was a nativist movement of white Americans who questioned the validity of his citizenship, his Christian faith, and his fidelity to America itself. This movement wielded inflammatory rhetoric to appeal to the real fear held by many Americans of varying polit political affiliation, that the country had irreversibly changed in ways that left them unheard and unserved and exposed and vulnerable. Then you presented the other side. He said that for black Americans who had spent decades working within the system, the election of a black president allowed them to dream even bigger. And for the young black men and women who had turned out in droves to cast their first ever votes for Obama, the backlash to his presidency and the constraints on his rule only created a new urgency. Talk about the premise of your book and how that connects to the discussion of objectivity. So I'm in the position, again, it's so strange because I was always very used to being like the young reporter, like, oh, that's Wes, he's like our young guy, he does stuff on the internet sometimes, you know, like, and now I have bylines that are a decade and more old, and that's frightening to me. But I've been in this, I've been on the, on the beat covering kind of issues of race and justice now for a little bit more than a decade. And... What's interesting is that you see yourself in some ways, or I see myself in some ways, as covering one story through all that time. Now, there are different chapters of it, there are different components of it, there are different parts of it, but that in many ways, I've been writing the same story. And it's been fascinating to think about and to look at. And, and so I remember my first book, which chronicled the early years of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which I had covered for The Post, and it came out the week after Donald Trump's election. Um, so didn't get a ton of coverage, but it was fine. The, um, and I remember, but the thing about writing a book is as soon as you publish the book, everyone starts asking you what the next book is, right? Which is kind of miserable because you're like, could you please read the first one or at least buy it? Like, don't, don't ask me about more work yet, right? But at this very moment that Donald Trump had been elected, 
that there was this moment of, in a lot of ways, confusion across the country. A lot of people genuinely hadn't believed this was a thing that was possible. A lot of people were genuinely very concerned about what was going to happen next. I was sitting here thinking about what's next. What's the next era? I had been imagining that the next era would be me figuring out if a President Hillary Clinton would be as solicitous of these young activists as a President Barack Obama had. How does this play out in, you know, when it's no longer a black president, X, Y, and Z? And now I'm seeing a different set of things happen. I'm sitting and watching, as protests break out across the country, I'm sitting and watching these moments and these stories of aggressive white racialized violence. A Muslim woman attacked on the, on the train or uh, a black man stabbed at a bus stop or I mean Nazis rallying and, and, and saying hail Hitler outside the inauguration, right? That there was this emboldenedness of, of explicitly white supremacist and racist rhetoric. Again, I'm not using this colloquially. I'm not talking about, well, this policy is tech. I mean, I mean actual avowed people who would self-describe themselves as racist. And this emergence, and this emergence of violence. And what I knew, having spent a lot of time getting to know the families of the people behind the hashtags and the issues of police violence, I knew that these cases were gonna have real people at their core, real victims, real families, that we were entering a moment of increased white racialized violence, we now had a president who was going to take no step to not fan those flames. In fact, was going to take every step to encourage those flames. And so I thought that if I was going to leave an artifact behind, it should be to seek to tell some of those stories of the people who would fall victim to the politics of our moment. And so what the book tries to do is it, it tracks 10 years from the election of Barack Obama to Charlottesville, and so there's plenty that happens afterwards, and it's referential, the things that happen afterwards, looking vignette by vignette at cases of anti-immigrant violence, anti-Muslim violence, anti-black violence, anti-Jewish violence, anti-Semitic violence, and, and tying them together and, and trying to place all of these individual acts into a, not only a, a contemporary context, but a historical context, because this is not the first moment in our history that in response to what is perceived as an increase in black political power or other minority political power, that we have seen the rise of a nativist movement and a backlash. And so the thought was, if we were gonna live through this, part of my job as a journalist who covered these issues was to as accurately as possible try to capture what we were living through, telling some of these stories and putting them together for the record, but secondarily, doing my best to try to help understand and contextualize them. Well, we've got about 20 minutes left. I'm sure the audience has some questions. Let's uh, take them. So uh, you could line up at the microphone and we could get your questions answered. doing well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, for, I'm just curious for a lot of us um, soon to be graduating uh, seniors here at the Cronkite School, um, if we were to um, take a job where perhaps media trust is very low amongst the population which we'd be serving, um, how would you go about trying to um, actively try to restore that trust through your work and through how you engage with that community? That's a great question. And I think that on a question like this, it's something we can all do better. I'm not some like expert at it. There are stories I wish I could go back and tweak a little bit or times where I've learned a lesson by screwing it up, right? Which is how a lot of us learn, no matter what, right? And so that, I think, is part of it. We have to accept as a premise that we're not gonna always be perfect, we're not gonna always do it exactly the right way, but that we wanna try and ask the right questions and figure it out, right? First and foremost, I think part of it is about doing the research and doing the homework, right? Trying to accept that there's way more that we don't know than we do know, and trying to really proactively try to figure out what we don't know. What are the books I need to read about this community? Who is the person who's really the mayor of this place? Not the elected official, but the person who really knows what's going on, right? How do I learn about where I am and what's happening and what really matters to people? I think, secondarily, a big part of it's about showing up. You know, when I, my first job was at the Boston Globe 
and I was covering both the city of Boston as well as local politics. And I was coming in as an outsider into what is a very vibrant and competitive local press corps. And they're all like, who the hell is this guy? And I was coming into a community that is a bit parochial and everyone knows everyone and where did you go to high school type of stuff. And I was from Cleveland. I didn't know anything about Boston. My ac it was very clear from my accent I wasn't from there. And, and so what I started doing though was I started just going to community meetings. Not the ones I was covering, but just, okay, on Tuesday this community is having a talk about this thing or this thing's in the news. And as you do that, you meet the person you're sitting next to. You listen and hear what's going on. I didn't have anything to do. I was like single and 22 and like, you know, I'd, and so I just showed up. And I will say that that really paid off over time. There were stories I got and, and things people said to me because they just had access to me because I was a member of their community in that way and I'd shown them, I'm not just sitting in the newsroom dictating stuff into the newspaper. I'm trying to be here and figure out what I don't know. I think secondarily, pe when people give us feedback, I think we want to take it, we want to try not to be too defensive about it, and we try to spit it forward. It's how do you turn a guy calling to curse you out because you screwed something up into a coffee meeting and now they're convinced they have to help you get it right. And now you've built the best source you're ever going to have in a community. And so I think about that a lot, right? What I do think is really great about this generation of emerging journalists, and again, I, I say this, not being that much older, but truly not thinking that me and my colleagues were as good at this as you all are, is you guys are starting by asking this question in the first place, and I think that sets you up for success in a way that a lot of us had to learn it on the job. Appreciate that, thank you. Of course. Hey, thanks for joining us, Mr. Lowry. Um, so I found it really interesting when, when you were talking a little bit about the uh, when, we, when you opened and talked about this debate of, of objectivity, uh, especially seeing there's another event here later today with uh, Len Downey about um, objectivity is, uh, uh, and it feels like it's something they say is, is worth giving up. And I wanted to talk about how in this debate you feel like it, people are talking past each other. So it's kind of a two-part question. Uh, does it feel like a time when, you know, the technological changes uh, that are taking place leave more room for that, that neutral center uh, being from a white perspective? You know, do you feel like there's kind of optimism for that uh, to change there? Kind of on the other side of the coin, can you talk a little bit about how you think uh, the way that we produce and consume news as professionals and as, as you know, a civic body politic uh, whether it's made it more likely for us to talk past each other. Thank you. Sorry. Of for course. The no, no, no. Those are those are both good questions. The short answer to both of them is yes. The we do exist in a time unlike any other time in the century since we've started this conversation because the news and access to information is democratized in a way that had never been true before. Each of us owns a printing press. Right, the public square is completely democratized. Any one of us right now, with our phone, can send something out that can be received by the entire world. That was never true until the moment it became true. And that has a lot of great things about it and a lot of not so great things about it. it on the one hand, it has allowed for, that democratization has allowed for a seat at the table and an attention uh, for people who otherwise would not have gotten it, right? That communities are able to democratically force the things they care about in front of our eyeballs by talking about them a lot or tweeting them about or saying things, right? There are stories that have been covered that we all know about that would not have been had this not been democratized this way. It also allows all of us to be party to conversations we would never be party to otherwise. We can sit and, I can sit and watch a bunch of LGBTQ activists talk online about their responses to something when previously I might not have been invited to that conversation. I can benefit from perspectives I just didn't have and didn't have access to, right? The, on the other hand, what it means is that people with unreliable information or partisan information or propagandist information also have access 
now in ways, not that they didn't always, there were always such papers and such, but have access to an audience they didn't quite have before. And very quickly, something that is untrue can spread across the entire world and can seep into our collective conscious and our collective understanding. We have people who, all of us, you know, and this is what I say, right? I think sometimes when we have these kind of more high-minded conversations, it's a bunch of us who work for some of the best news organizations in the world, right? And we're trying to talk about the industry as if what we do is representative of the industry at large. And I actually don't think that's true, right? That if only the average piece of media that a reader was consuming was at the level of the New York Times or the Washington Post. But we know that's not true. Were I to open my Facebook page right now and click on the first 10 links, seven of them I should absolutely not believe, right? That the average piece of content of media that a reader or a viewer is consuming is bad, <laughs> is fake news or whatever term we want to use for it, right? One of the reasons people have lost trust is because when they consume something, they can't necessarily trust that it's true. And that's not a criticism, again, of the people who are doing the best and the hardest work, although there are criticisms there too, but it's this idea that because the printing presses have been so democratized, well, everyone has a printing press. And as much as I love my aunt, what she's printing on her press might not be fact-checked, right? Like, and so I, I think that that, but I think that that in this moment makes it even more important for those of us who take this up as a profession or as a calling to commit ourselves to, you know, again, not being defensive about criticisms, but really saying, how can we be better? Because it's so much more important in this moment that people have a place to go to explain things. I actually think it can allow us to pivot from some of the more piecemeal, update, calendar type coverage into a more contextualizing role. Everyone on the internet can tell you what happened yesterday. What I need the media to do, the press to do, is to tell me what really happened yesterday. And sometimes that it takes 48 hours to make some phone calls. Sometimes it takes a week. Sometimes it takes a year. And again, I think the best of our profession already does this. I think it's more difficult sometimes for us always to do it. What was the second part? I lost myself in all the talking. What was number two? I think that we have a real hard time, and again, I think the best of us already resist this, but I think we've always had a really hard time with the reality that the majority of our media operate in the, um, in the private market, right? Like we have a capitalism problem, not to go all marks, right? But the issue is that there are points for all of our news organizations where our interest as a company can clash with our values as, as a journalistic organization. And I don't even mean that in like big sweeping ways. It's the small little compromise here and there and here, but those things add up, right? I, I think about this all the time, my friends at broadcast news or cable news even. And I watch a segment and I think about, okay, if I was given five minutes to explain this topic, is this how I would do it? If my goal were to inform. If I called five experts on this topic and I had them watch this, would they say, yes, this was the best way to use five minutes to inform someone on this topic? And as we know, the answer would almost always be no. Right, that we have to think about, we do have to think about selling the newspaper. We do have to think about capturing audience or, or retaining advertisers. We do have to think about keeping you watching. And all of those things at times can conflict with what we would do in a virtuous vacuum to ideally best inform you. And I think that sometimes we're really hesitant to acknowledge the fact that there is a push and pull there. And I think that that, when we think about a lot of the things that, that make our public square hard and unbearable, right? The rank partisanship, the talking past each other, the disagreement for the sake of disagreement, the sensationalism, the conflict, right? These are, in fact, things that are built into parts of our business model, even in some of the best um, and highest operating places. And, and I think that in a world where we had more independence financially, 
maybe we would be able to provide better information, right? Lippmann called for political independence, but he also talked a bit about uh, financial independence. And I think that we, writ large, did a great job of achieving our political independence. But the reality is we are still very much slave to the market in this way. If Facebook wants to do this thing, suddenly we're all hiring a bunch of people to do this. Right now, even in the nonprofit space, the, the funders want to pay for this, so we're all doing it. And, and that doesn't necessarily allow us the same space to say, well, but this is what we need to do today. And it's a, it's a balance, and it's a push and pull, and I think it's hard sometimes. Um, my question is, um, what advice would you give to black and other minority reporters um, in advocating and serving their communities through their stories while still trying to keep objectivity? Sure. That's a good question. I think that, I think first and foremost, I think that we have to devote ourselves to, to our craft, right? That we're all still learning. We're all still trying to get better. But the best way to serve the communities we want to serve and to tell the stories we want to tell is to be the best possible storyteller and to be prepared to tell those stories. And I think that that, and that means even when we get assignments that are not the thing that we are hyper passionate about, it's what can I learn from this? How do I build on it? What do I do next, right? And then as we build our competency, and as we build our expertise, we need to be unafraid to pitch and champion and advocate the types of stories that, because of who we are, we can see, but maybe some of our colleagues can't. Right? That a big part of what we bring, or any person brings to the newsroom, is themselves, their sourcing, their place, their perspective, right? Not, not even in a point of view way, I mean, just literally what they can see that someone else cannot. And, and so, but again, what empowers us to best do that, to best do that work, is by being expert at the work that we do. That when we walk in the room, they know, well, we might not even understand this story, but if Wesley says it's a good one, we gotta go do it, right? And it's trying to do the work to build that credibility internally. That's not to say it's not gonna be hard. It's not gonna be difficult. It's not gonna be frustrating. It's always gonna be frustrating to be of a minority group in a majority space, no matter what, what that majority or minority is, right? Um, I think the other thing that we said there is, one of the things I say to students very often is we focus a lot on our vertical relationships, our editor, our mentor, our, but I think it's also important to focus on those horizontal relationships, right? That there are other reporters like you who are navigating these same dynamics and those peers are going to be the people who support you and sustain you throughout your career, who are going to be able to give you that advice, who are going to be able to say, well, I did this like this over here, and so why don't you try this that way, right? And so at a time increasingly where so many newsrooms have editing crises, where there aren't the same resources, people aren't necessarily getting the same guidance and the same mentorship, there's this thing that we can do to support each other and support our peers who are all kind of in this process the same way. So as we close out, as, oh, if there's another question, please come on. I'm very curious, very curious about some very far right, um, supposedly journalism. Do you believe these unbelievable statements that are being spoken? Do they really believe it, or is it theater? <laughs> some of them do. I think some of them are so irresponsible that they don't even care whether they believe it or not. That they think they do, they think, I mean look, when me and my buddies are at the bar, sometimes we have an argument, you know, we're watching sports, sometimes I might stake out a position I don't really believe, but like here we are having fun. And unfortunately for a lot of people, our public square and our public dialogue is a really fun game that makes them a lot of money. And so at the core, do they believe some of it? Maybe. I think a lot of them also do exist in these echo chambers and spheres where they're so cut off from objective information that they would be unable to understand it even if they saw it. This was what, this happened, we, we see this a lot now in the documents coming out in the Fox News lawsuit with Dominion, but let's re remind ourselves that this also happened in 2012, where if you were a consumer of Fox News, you were convinced there was no way Barack Obama could meet Mitt Romney. 
and live on air, Karl Rove was going, this can't be true, this isn't real. That we have people who consume our partisan media and it leaves them incapable of accepting reality when it happens because they've been unprepared for it. And at that point, I, whether they believe all of the things or not, the things they do believe are so untethered from truth that it, it all ends up kind of getting caught up in the wash there. Okay, we have one other question, please. more of a piggybacking on what you talked about, capitalism versus pure journalism. Truth and trust, we have a local issue and then there was a national banking issue. SBV Bank was downgraded to a F rating in 2021, yet there was no news media about that at all. The Phoenix Police has been investigated by the Department of Justice for the last two years. And other than some local small reporters trying to get information, nothing national, nothing local in the, in the main media. So what I'm saying is it's difficult to keep the truth and trust in the media when they don't seem to be as aggressive to finding that pure journalism. Thank you. Well, and I think that the thing there, I, I don't think it's about the journalists themselves who I think are as committed and devoted as they've ever been. I do think it's hard for us to even grasp the amount of journalistic resource that has been lost over the last half a century. I was working on a project recently that involved getting a bunch of old magazines, old Rolling Stones and GQs and, you know, Esquire, GQ, Rolling Stone used to send a 200-page magazine every month they would publish more long-form journalism in one month than they can do all year now. And those, that was just one set of magazines. The newspapers, I did a project about the Philadelphia Inquirer last year, the newspapers used to be hundreds of pages. Now, a lot of that was ads and classifieds, but a lot of that was journalism. And we have contracted significantly. Now, there are real sustained, ambitious efforts to try to rebuild these ecosystems in the nonprofit space. Um, it, it, we, we've seen expansion of whether it be the Times and the Post, which is great. But I do think it's hard for us to sometimes even grasp how much we have lost in terms of just qualified, rigorous reporters, reporters working under qualified, rigorous editors, given time and space to tell stories. And and I think that that does really harm our public ability to know what's happening. When I, when, I would, when I was at the Post, and even since, when I pick up a story or start working on it, I'm almost always deeply thankful for the efforts of the local journalists and the other journalists who've covered it. And I'm almost always equally horrified by how few rocks have been unturned. Wait, I'm the first person who's called this guy on the story that people have written about or talked about. No one got the document ever. No one did the... And again, that's not necessarily the fault of the individuals, but I do think it speaks to the status of the industry, and, and that is something that I, I do think really hurts us and hurts our democracy. Okay, I'm going to ask you three things, and hopefully I won't forget them. Um, the first is, because of that, that drawdown, is there still... Uh, journalistic integrity at the highest level, and it just a local newspaper, like we were talking about. The gentleman was talking about a local thing. Are there editors who say, no, I need another source before I can go with this? Or to look at the value of the source, is it somebody who had a dream about something and became a ghost, and uh, is that kind of thing, like address? Is the, do we have the resources, does the industry have the resources to really do good journalism um, at that? And then the other thing I wanted to say is, on the way here today, I experienced something I had never heard of five years ago, which might just show how ignorant I am, but something called white privilege. I was on a train coming down here and security officers got on and checked to see if you had a bus pass. And I held mine out with everybody else. The three black individuals, the Asian, 
and the Middle Eastern looking gentleman, they all checked theirs. I held mine up and they walked right past in both directions, never even looked at it. And why that would, but I would have never questioned that a few years ago because I just wasn't raised that way. I don't, I don't see people as being different. And I've, I can tell you stories. I've been in rooms where we say, we have to promote a minority. Who's the dumbest one that we could possibly promote so they, they don't become our boss? Somebody we know we can step on in the future. And then the third thing is once I sit down, will you mention the name of your book again so I can write it down? <laughs> of course. Okay. Thank I, you. I think that to your first question, I think there were really hardworking journalists in every market, in, in every, uh, in, in probably in every uh, organization, there are a few maybe not, but in, but in the vast majority. I, I don't think that the problems facing us are, are about the determination of the people. I think so often it's about the pressures of the reality that we exist in. And so there are great journalists who are working hard, who want to vet the source, who want to make the call, who want to do the thing, and who just so often, because of the speed with which we're moving, with the lack of an editor to check what's going on, with the, that I think stuff falls through the cracks. I mean, I, when I talk to young journalists all the time, it's all they want to do is reporting that's more rigorous or that involves following up or makes more phone calls, but because of what they have to do to to keep up with the demands of the industry right now, which is, well, we need we needed something quick on this, and we need something quick on this, and how do we do this? That so often they don't have the opportunity to do that. I think that I appreciate you sharing the story you shared, and I and I think it does speak to, and I think even your awareness to be able to recognize what was going on, I think speaks to that democratization that we talked about earlier, where we all can now see with our own eyes things we never would have seen before. And that, I think, empowers us to better understand the world we live in. Um, and so now, suddenly, we've been, what we can recognize things when we see them because we've been party to conversations maybe we wouldn't have been party to before. Um, the book is American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of Progress, and it's out on June 27th. We'll take one last question, then we have to move. I'll make it quick. When I was a pup a thousand years ago, when Walter Cronkite was actually on the air and I watched him, they had news and commentary. That was definitive. They had a de definite. Now, of course, everybody's biased. I don't think you're ever going to get rid of bias completely. But it, should we go back to that concept where you have news and commentary, and instead of mashing them together, which is what I think you see now pretty much? I, I do think there's a lot of real difficulty with this. I, I mean, it's unquestionably true that there's been a flattening, and even beyond the actual flattening, which I think has happened, there's also something different in our distribution models because so much of what we're encountering, we're encountering on our phone and online, and labeling might be different and th versus when we all knew, okay, on the newscast, these, these segments are this and this segment is that. Or in the paper, well, if it's in a column, I know what that is. Or it's on the op-ed page, I know what that is. There is, I do actually think there is a real like, uh, challenge in how we receive and how we package. What is also true is that we have, and this isn't necessarily new, uh, it's happened previously and, and it's happened historically. What's also true is that we're in a moment where we have columnists who break news, or, or penionated folks who are advancing storylines further. We have straight news reporters who can write news analysis pieces. Well, okay, well, what is, and, and so I do think there's some real, comp, comp, like, I think there's some difficulty there. I do think that having a better and clearer labeling and a more specific, this is what this is versus this is what this is, would help. What I do think is very hard is that I think that the places that do the best of journalism already do that pretty well. It could always be better. I think what's most hard is that we have some behemoths in our field who are poisoning the water and who don't really care <laughs> about our standards or what we want or how we want to do it. That we can get the Times and 60 Minutes and the Post and the Wall Street Journal all in a room and we can argue about like one inch of difference for the rest of our lives 
if Fox News isn't in the room, we're not going to be able to fix it, right? Or if the, and I think that that's really hard. We have to deal with um, we, we, some of those powerful media organizations in our country just have no regard for any of this. It's a capitalistic play for them. Uh, and a lot of us, even as we have real good faith disagreements about things, are completely on the same side compared to where some of those folks are. And we just don't have any power to pressure them or change them into behaving differently. Go ahead. Will Dominion, if they prevail, will it have an influence on how news is delivered? Can we end on an upbeat? <laughs> uh, I like the hopes. So. You know, so look, I, I mean, I, I try really hard not to prognosticate even as I, you know, get to exist in more of an analyst role and do, I write, you know, opinionated pieces sometimes. I do think that the Dominion suit seems extremely strong. The things we've seen come out are remarkably damning. It's extremely obvious that this was not a news organization or is not a news organization based on how we understand news to operate. Um, that said, $1.6 billion isn't that much to Rupert Murdoch. Um, and, and so I wonder, I, I really do, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if Dominion prevails, which is an open question, I mean, again, I, I think their arguments have been compelling and the evidence has been clear, but who knows, I'm not the judge in the case. Um, I do think there's a possibility some of that could change. I, I think that with a lot of not just this organization, but others um, that are more right-wing propaganda organizations, it's become very clear the only way to get them to listen is through this type of legal action. And so I do think there's a chance that if Fox has to pay a real penalty for this, that it might change some of the operating procedures in some of these places. But that said, um, there is a real, like I said, we, we have a really wild west media ecosystem right now where a lot of stuff moves very quickly, fair or unfair, and as much as I hope that this Dominion case changes some of those practices, I, I, I think it might be, <laughs> you know, we'll whack one mole and whack a mole, but there's gonna be another one popping up, unfortunately. Wes, thank you. Thank you. And now I believe we have a bit of a break uh, before our, our next uh, discussion on beyond objectivity. So hope that you all will stick around uh, for our afternoon uh, discussion. Thank you very much. So good to see you.